All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hegel and the Left, a panel presented by the Platypus Affiliated Society. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s through 30s, new 1960s through 70s, and post-political 1980s through 90s left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. We are located on campuses around the world and run reading groups in public for our year round. You can find us virtually at platypus1917.org forward slash virtual. You can also find the Platypus Review, our forum in print online at platypus1917.org. And you can check our podcast, Shit Platypus Says, on SoundCloud or Apple Podcasts. So today our panel is about Hegel and the left. On the occasion of Hegel's 250th birthday, the Platypus, Platypus, I'm sorry, Affiliated Society asks the question, how does Hegel task the left in Marxism today? And first I'm gonna go around and introduce our panelists in the exact order they'll be presenting. So first we have um, Andy Blinden. Uh, he's the Marxist Internet Archive Secretary and the maintainer of its Hegel Reference Archive, its philosophy subject reference section, and also the Marx Engels Archive. And he's the author of Hegel for Social Movements, published by Brill in 2019. Uh, we have Henry Pickford, a professor in the Department of German Studies in the Department of Philosophy at Duke University. He is working on his book project entitled Theodore W. Adorno, A Critical Life. We have Adrian Johnston, a distinguished professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of New Mexico. He is the author of A New German Idealism, Hegel, Zizek, and Dialectical Materialism published by uh, Columbia University Press in 2018. And lastly, we have one of our own, Jensen Suther, a member of the Platypus Affiliated Society, a PhD student in the Department of Comparative Literature at Yale University. And he's working on a book project entitled Hegel's Materialism, The Logic of Critical Theory. So the way this is gonna work is that we're gonna give each of the panelists about 10 minutes to give their opening remarks. I'll signal you when you have two minutes left. We'll follow that with a quick round of responses so the panelists can respond to each other, and those will be a maximum of about three minutes. And then we'll open it up for audience question and answer. So the audience, you can basically ask a question either by typing it in the Q&A box or by raising your hand via Zoom, and we can, be recognized, we can recognize you to basically say your question out loud. All right, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Andy Blinden. Hegel has been the intellectual inspiration behind every current of radical social criticism since his death in 1831. Marxism, anarchism, the civil rights movement, the anti-AIDS movement, deconstruction, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, and the gender diversity movement. Not bad going for an old idealist, eh? Nowadays, almost everyone who reads Hegel for the purpose of social criticism takes Hegel's spirit to be human activity. However, I think this interpretation is more or less what I would call a general orientation. I think I'm the only person who has been able to carry this interpretation through consistently with Hegel's conception of action as elaborated in the logic and the philosophy of spirit. To do this, I've appropriated the cultural psychology of Lev Vygotsky and the activity theory of his younger associate, A.N. Leontief. Now, I know that Vygotsky never read Hegel, and I have no evidence that Leontief had either, though later exponents such as Ilyankov were quite conversant with Hegel. They developed a psychology, but a psychology which was in its basic conception interdisciplinary and further, in contrast to the usual ideological critique the work of the Soviet psychologists is firmly rooted in experimental science and used as a practical theory in child development, education, linguistics, and psychotherapy around the world. In other words, it is firmly grounded in modern science. How do I explain the conformity of cultural psychology with Hegelian philosophy? As ever, it's the times they lived in. This current of science was born in the crucible of the Russian Revolution, Vygotsky was immersed in the revolution inspired by Marx, Engels, and Lenin, and de dedicated himself to the tasks of rebuilding a shattered nation in the midst of trauma. He learned his Hegel secondhand, but he learned it well. 
As the revolution degenerated and Stalin tightened his grip, this current of thinking was suppressed and only became widely influential in the 1980s as it began to spread outside of the Soviet Union. Let me outline some synergies. Firstly, Hegel devoted the introduction to his encyclopedia to proving that the subject's knowledge of the object is both immediate and mediated. This is presented in the form of a critique of four defining currents of modern philosophy. Vygotsky's discovery was that this triangular relation, both immediate and mediated, can be captured in germ by what is called in psychology double stimulation. That is the subject acting on or perceiving an object both immediately and mediated by some cultural artifact be that a sign or a tool. By placing an artifact from the cultural environment for the subject to use to act on an object, we create a germ cell or concrete simple something which can be studied in the laboratory or observed in cultural life. So Vygotsky realized the encyclopedia as a practical scientific project. Hegel understood this, and in, in the syllogism of action, in the penultimate section of the science of logic, Hegel makes the point that the subject acts on and knows the world only by placing a material artifact between itself and the external world. Secondly, I've just used this rather unusual expression, a concrete simple something. This is the expression that Hegel uses to describe das Esther, the first, from which each of the sciences in the encyclopedia begins. Each science takes up some phenomenon and by analysis determines that concrete simple something which is at the same time universal. He actually uses the same approach in, in the logic. Being is analyzed and determined as the one, the science, and is from the one that the logic of being is unfolded. Vygotsky makes this his principle, and by using it makes a revolution in five different domains of psychology. I use this method in my social and political analysis too, guided by the more precise elaboration Hegel gave to the concept. Thirdly, Leontief developed a theory of activity. This gives us a materialist or praxis understanding of what is meant by a concept, that is the specific form of human practice. The theory of personality, which Leontief built on this foundation, is remarkably symmetrical to Hegel's theory of morality as outlined in the philosophy of right. It also has the advantage that it can be interpreted as the foundation for a social theory, as can the philosophy of right itself. Leontief failed in his attempt to develop it in that direction, but this was a task which was really impossible for him, given the conditions he worked in in the USSR. I could go on. Most of the work posed by this conjunction still remains to be done. Regrettably, the number of Marxists who have a deep understanding of both Hegel and Vygotsky is extremely limited, even though both writers have a readership numbering in the millions. We have to be done with proving the similarity of Marx's capital and Hegel's logic, for example, and use this fantastic legacy to solve real social and political problems. Okay, that's all I've got. My bad. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now if there's no more delay, we can move on to Henry Pickford. Thanks very much. Mine's going to be a slightly different talk. Um, I might go over a couple of minutes. I apologize. I assumed that Andy would be talking about Hegel and Marx, so I was going to pick up the story and talk about Marx and Adorno. Um, uh, but I'll make some introductory remarks, hopefully for for people in the audience. Um, uh, let's see. So critical theory as a group of thinkers centered around the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany, between the wars. Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, among others. Uh, they instituted a multidisciplinary research program weaving together German idealism, Marxism, Freudian psychoanalysis, political and economic theory. 
the question they confronted baldly, baldly put was that it seemed according to Marxist uh, analysis um, that there would be a world revolution going on at the turn of the 20th century. It seemed that the technological innovations and advancements, the rise of an international working class um, would usher in the radical social transformation that both uh, that, that Marx had anticipated. But instead, we have regressive tendencies. We have the rise of Soviet state planning economy, fascism in Germany and Italy, and the curtailing of radical movements by the New Deal in the United States, by the advent of the welfare state. So the project they set themselves was try to explain why there was this regression rather than uh, progression. And in the background, I would argue, is still the sort of Hegelian idea of um, a rationally constructed world or social um, second nature in which people would feel at home and in which they could realize and actualize their idea, their individual and collective notion of freedom. So I think that's just going on in the background. Um, what I want to talk about is, is critical theory in relation to Marx in two ways. One, the diagnosis of late or monopoly capitalism um, coming out uh, as a transition from free market capitalism or higher liberal capitalism. Some of these characteristics that they outlined and here the chief figure is the economist of the Institute, Friedrich Pollock. Uh, first, that inter industries became monopolies, think of railroads and utilities, and that they became closely uh, aligned with the state. So you had the rise of what, uh, what some of the folks in this uh, institute called an administrative class or an administrative elite. Um, secondly, this led to what they called the integration of the state and the economy and the advent of the political category of the mass or the masses. Um, an essential agent of this integration was the culture industry, which replaced sort of autonomous art that could have a social critical function. Instead, um, culture industry was, quote, intentionally integrated as consumers from above through standardization and content and rationalization of distribution, resulting in the passive consumption of ideological products that reinforce conformist attitudes. And then lastly, well, people on the panel will know this, of course, that because of this integration and because of the massive asymmetry and power between sort of the administration, the administrative elite on the one hand and the masses on the other, the idea of a proletarian or working class consciousness seemed to be almost impossible. And this explains why there might've been a regression. Um, the main point I wanna make, however, is that through this analysis, Adorno and Horkheimer came to see the, the, the topic of their inquiries to be not so much the economy in a narrow sense, but rather the, no, the nature of domination and its relationship to self-preservation. And that they, especially Adorno, pursued that notion of domination into the very categories of judgment that underlie political economy, uh, both in the classical sense as well in the, in the Marxist sense. And so in the few minutes remaining to me, I wanna do a little bit of a technical reading to try to flesh that out in a way that might bring um, an interest in Hegel back, uh, back to us. Um, so the question is, how does domination manifest itself before and within the discourse or theory of political economy which is how capitalism understands and justifies itself. Here, the work to turn to, I think, is Adorno's 1966 book, Negative Dialectics, which can be read in part as a critique of political economy in the Marxian tradition, as an imminent critique of the epistemological categories at work in capitalism that Marx pursued in his own writings, obviously with Hegel in the background. Society for Adorno is constituted by the relationship of exchange, which presupposes the category of abstract equivalence because commodities that have nothing concretely in common, say a bicycle and a shirt, are nonetheless bought and sold uh, uh, or exchanged as equivalents. In Capital, Marx shows that the commodity and the labor represented in the commodity each have what he calls a double character. The use values and qualitative properties of commodities are disregarded in that their value is expressed as abstractly equivalent exchange values. And similarly, the differences in the concrete labors that produce commodities are abstracted into units of average socially necessary labor time, that as the value of the commodities render them exchangeable. Adorno emphasizes that this process of what he calls real abstraction is presupposed in practical acts of exchange. Quote, one cannot arrive at relationships of exchange without a moment of conceptuality. The conceptuality in the relationship of exchange is itself a kind of facticity or second nature as the law of value that comes into force without men being conscious of it, end quote. In real abstraction, what appears identical in the form of abstract equivalence 
is, in Adorno's words, non-identity under the aspect of identity, which is his Adorno's definition of contradiction. Categories such as the principle of exchange, abstract equivalence, and identity thinking unfold the imminent historically specific contradiction, the what Adorno calls social a priori underlying bourgeois political economy. The model here is Marx's analysis that uncovers non-identity within central concepts of political economy. With regard to the bourgeois concept of freedom, workers are formally free to sell their labor power, yet dispossessed of the means to live and the means of production, they have no choice but to sell themselves. The exchange of labor power for a wage, thus, is both free and unfree. So too, the value of the purchased commodity labor power is both the value of its reproduction as it is consumed and the surplus value produced from its consumption that is appropriated by the capitalist. Thus, the exchange of labor power for a wage is both just and unjust. The general mystification of central concepts of political economy that masks such non-identity, Adorno calls concept fetishism and identity thinking, for which he offers an historical materialist account. Quote, the exchange principle, the reduction of human labor to its abstract universal concept of average labor time has the same origin as the principle of identity. It has its social model in exchange and exchange would be nothing without identity. The spread of the principle imposes on the whole world an obligation to become identical, to become total, unquote. That is identity thinking and epistemology merges with the exchange principle and economic praxis through the cognitive judging of abstract equivalence. Adorno is working here with a Kantian epistemology according to which objectively valid knowledge claims rely on the subsumption of particular sensuous intuitions under universal concepts and categories of judgment. First, the predictive ju uh, predicative judgment of perception amounts to the mind's cutting away qualitatively particular sensuous intuition to make it abstractly equivalent to the concept under which it is subsumed that can be considered a form of cognitive domination. But second, once a cognitive act of the understanding has been executed, the resulting judgment is available for use in syllogistic reasoning. And this operation amounts to an abstract equivalence between the non-equivalent reference of those perceptual predications, the sensuous particulars or their intuitions. Just as exchange value, the abstraction of labor time exerted in producing a commodity is not an inherent property of the thing, but rather the socially necessary form in which objects appear under capitalism. So too, identity thinking imputes the abstract identity between non-identical particulars via the universal, the concept, under which they are subsumed. And just as according to Marx, a commodity has a use value, its inherent properties that potentially satisfy human needs, so too a concept has its, in, in, its intrinsic, or in Adorno's words, emphatic idea. The set of properties, the situations, the objects that ideally would fulfill the concept and what Adorno calls rational identity. Just as Marx does not abstractly negate the concepts of political economy, but rather imminently criticizes them to drive them beyond their present contradiction. For instance, that exchange of labor power is both just and unjust, both free and unfree. So too, uh, Adorno argues the following. And I'm, I wanna put this in the chat because it's a, it's a quote by Adorno. And as everyone knows, understanding Adorno in writing is hard enough, let alone um, verbally. So this is a quote by Adorno. If comparability as a category of measure were simply annulled, the rationality that is inherent in the exchange principle as ideology, of course, but also as a promise would give way to direct appropriation, to force, and nowadays to the naked privilege of monopolies and cliques. When we criticize the exchange principle as the identifying principle of thought, we want to realize the ideal of free and just exchange. To date, this idea is only a pretense. Its realization alone would transcend exchange. If critical theory has unmasked it for what it is, an exchange of things that are equal and yet unequal, then the critique of the inequality within equality aims also at equality. If no person were denied a part of his living labor anymore, then rational identity would be achieved and society would have transcended identity thinking." Unquote. By taking the emphatic idea of a concept not only as ideology, but also as an indeterminate promise, Marx and Adorno perform a twofold imminent critique in which present conditions are shown to contradict the reigning ideology. And rather than being uh, abstractly negated for fa failing to represent reality, the ideology is taken as it were at its word as an indeterminate promise of its realization. Such a transcendence of abstract exchange and identity thinking might be glossed by Marx's underdetermined particularist ideal in his uh, critique of the Gotha program, 
quote, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, unquote. Similarly, transcending identity thinking would aim for, in Adorno's words, unreduced experience via epistemic acts that non-coercively modulate between particular and universal, between intuition and concept. As Adorno puts it, quote, a utopia would be above identity and above contradiction. It would be a togetherness in diversity, end quote. To this would correspond the fulfilled promise implicit in the idea of a just exchange of labor power. As he wrote in 1969, uh, Adorno wrote, to go beyond the principle of exchange means at the same time to fulfill it. No one should receive less than the equivalent of the average societal labor, end quote. So in conclusion, Adorno's turn to epistemology and sociology is a deepening of Marx's critique of political economy, now directed at the contradictions and, do and domination within the objective and subjective conditions that underlie abstract equivalence and commodity exchange. By, by situating these concepts in their specific historical and social context, as Marx did with value, labor, and private property, Adorno's analysis is recognizably materialist or Marxist. By not forsaking the utopian norms, the promise inherent in bourgeois concepts, however, Adorno is recognizably idealist or Hegelian. Adorno's project to grasp the materialism within philosophy aligns him with the two most influential Marxist writers directly preceding him, who in 1923 investigated the role of Hegelian philosophy in Marxist thought. Georg Lukács' History in, uh, in Class Consciousness and Karl Korsch's Marxism and Philosophy, whose epigraph quotes Lenin, quote, we must organize a systematic study of the Hegelian dialectic from a materialist standpoint, end quote. Adorno too saw his project as developing Marxist critique of political economy by criticizing its philosophical categories. As he said at the conclusion of his 1962 seminar on Marx and sociology, quote, the genius of Marx consisted precisely in the fact that filled with disgust, he tackled exactly that which he found disgusting, the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Henry. And uh, now we'll move on to Adrian. I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Kevin, Justin, and the other members of the Platypus Society for organizing this event and kindly inviting me to participate. Uh, I also would like to thank everyone who is here, my fellow panelists, as well as the audience uh, for joining us for what I hope will be an afternoon or early evening of productive conversation. Um, I decided to focus on the Hegel-Marx link and moreover to do so by zeroing in on two particular features of Hegel's socio-political thought. And moreover, one of the things that I will be doing is arguing that there is a subtle but nonetheless very significant link between these two topics and Hegel's uh, sociopolitical thought that often aren't uh, tightly tied together by commentators, um, and then use this to talk about what the contemporary upshot of rereading this Hegel in relation to Marx uh, would be for today. And the two topics in Hegel's sociopolitical philosophy that I will be speaking about in my 10 minutes here will be first, uh, various observations, including critical ones that he makes about private property and the especially modern forms of private property and the influence or consequences um, that this particular, we might say, category, institution, or practice has for uh, our you know, societies and for what we might you know, speak of as our geist in the broadest of Hegelian senses. And secondly, um, Hegel's very stringent critique of the one person, one vote franchise. And of course, I've chosen this second topic, given that here we are having this panel on the eve of the November 3rd presidential election, um, and that this, you know, this there's nothing that is more palpably present in our collective consciousness than, than things connected with this topic. Um, and I hope that I can you know, show that Hegel reread th re -read through Marx in relation to this uh, is, should be interesting to us in our present time and at this very moment. Now, 
Uh, apropos uh, Hegel on private property, uh, one of the things that I would want to argue and that, you know, if in the in the discussion and the Q&A uh, people want to get into is that if you look at the various things that Hegel says about this topic, um, that clearly in his view, although one cannot say that uh, modern civil society with its marketplaces, in other words, what we would now call uh, capitalism, uh, that we cannot claim that it invents this and that indeed Marx as, uh, I'm sorry, Hegel, like Marx, as a very careful reader of Aristotle, is well aware that, uh, you know, some of what is involved in capitalism that especially Marxists uh, critique of political economy zeroes in on, um, we already can find Aristotle complaining about when talking about crematistics and the politics and dealing with uh, what he sees as a perversion that is not part of economy as concerned with the oikos, namely uh, the lust for the unlimited accumulation of quantifiable wealth on the part of certain merchants or traders. Um, but what for Aristotle is this outlying perversion, you know, of course, becomes the central norm, uh, you know, under the modern form of capitalism. And I think Hegel, uh, you know, also views it in this way, and that there are indication in, indications throughout his socio-political writings from the late 1790s onwards, um, that, you know, in Hegel's view, um, the manner in which private property becomes quantified and hence becomes something that can be pursued in this limitless, insatiable fashion um, is something that does indeed concern him about modern industrial capitalist uh, socioeconomic systems. And furthermore, I th he indicates an awareness that with the you know, with the becoming central of private property in this fashion, um, that the very, again, you know, category, institution, practice, or set of practices involving private property come to uh, spread their influence far and wide, well beyond the spheres of the economy or the marketplace uh, per se. And that, of course, you know, something that obviously concerns Hegel throughout his his. Uh, career is the manner in which if we take the tripartite schema from 1821's philosophy of right of the family, civil society, and the state, and we locate the marketplace, of course, there squarely at the level of civil society, that the that private property exerts influence that bleeds into, you know, family structures below and state structures above. Uh, and that, of course, all of our social relations get, in a sense, rewritten or recodified in the form of market relations. And that obviously this is something which has continued to, you know, we are living in the thick of today in a way that's even more pronounced than what Hegel had in view and, and was anxious about. Um, but I think that there is in Marx, I mean, in Hegel already a kind of proto-historical materialist argument about once you have a form of society that's grounded on private property in this sense, that private property starting at the economic level is going to, um, you know, exert an ever more intense and ever more extensive influence over the, you know, the over social structure as a whole. Um, and I think that this is something which, although it might seem well when Hegel is critiquing the one person, one vote uh, 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 system in texts such as the 1815-1816 uh, commentary on the deliberations in the Württemberg Assembly, uh, or of course uh, on the eve of Hegel's death, his 1831 text on the English Reform Bill, which is where you have the best known instance of Hegel harshly criticizing uh, the kind of voting model that of course was you know, at stake in the English Reform Bill itself, and that is also central to what we either have done by mail already or will be doing between now on November 3rd here, um, that I think that for Hegel, in addition to all of the other objections that he lays out apropos the institution of voting, that there is a subtle but nonetheless significant link in terms of Hegel's worries about private property and the broader social consequences it has, and in particular, the manner in which private property becomes a model even for how we think about ourselves in terms of the ideology of individualism and the model of ourselves as the owners or possessors of ourselves, and that this provides a bridge to the topic of voting and Hegel's critique 
critique of it. Um, and that, of course, when we talk about hyper individualism and the idea of myself as uh, a self qua in possession of myself as the owner of myself, um, you know, of course, there's links that we could establish between these subtle points in Hegel and then Marx, of course, talking about the consequences of the coming into existence of the category of commodified labor power and the manner in which, I mean, for instance, Henry mentioned the young Lukács and, you know, of course, he does quite a bit to show, you know, just how insidious right down to the level of, you know, what we would take to be our own self-consciousness, our private mindset, etc., um, being subjected to commodification, reification, and especially becoming commodified labor power is for us and how much of our sense of our individuality is colored by that. Um, but that for Hegel, I think in addition to you know, his various criticisms about one person, one vote, where for him, it's not only that it's democratically ineffective, but it even is democratically deleterious, despite being celebrated as, you know, the ritual marking, you know, uh, uh, you know, are, are actually being privileged to live in and be participants in what could be dubbed a democratic system. Um, that for Hegel instead is that the, you know, apart from issues having to do with the content of the choices that were offered as voters, uh, you know, or, you know, the, the outcomes of, of the voting process, uh, you know, in terms of the tallying of our votes and the you know, implications that it has in terms of who ends up in power and who doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. I think that for Hegel, there's also the issue of the very form of the ritual of voting is a manner in which we have this idea of, of democracy linked to this, this hyper individualism in which it is you know, a matter of me as the possessor of my private opinions, beliefs, convictions, values, ideals, uh, and then of course my choice in terms of my individual vote. And right down to the, to the very character of the ritual itself, I mean, pre-pandemic, of course, um, you, know, you have the minimal social experience of, all right, I go to a public place and I stand in line with a group of people like at the DMV. But then of course, there's the, you know, the, you know, the, the you know, the almost religious like, uh, uh, you know, sense of, you know, hushed awe and reverence in terms of entering the private sanctum of the voting booth, uh, you know, and of course, there are arguments for why that has to be kept private, but there's also the manner in which, you know, I'm made to experience myself as this isolated monad, you know, who, of course, will tick off the boxes or pull the levers, you know, for certain choices offered to me rather than others. But even with the pandemic, I mean, in a way, it's more private. I, I you know, I voted by mail recently, I didn't even have to stand in line with fellow citizens. I could just sit here in the, you know, in the solipsistic privacy of my own study, you know, fill in the bubbles and, you know, drop it in the mailbox without ever having to interact with a single soul. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, for Hegel, there would be this sense in which the individualism, which is of great concern to him at various points in his political thinking, um, is this is another facet of the one person, one vote model, in addition to all the other criticisms he lobs at it, um, that I think that he would want to emphasize the manner in which the very form of the ritual itself, uh, you know, in addition to problems at the level of its content, its consequences, et cetera, um, would be something he would want to warn us about. Um, and Justin, if you don't mind, how much time do I have left? You got about 30 seconds. Okay, perfect. Well, then I can say that, you know, this is, it's here, I would say that Hegel and Marx taken together um, don't necessarily uh, offer us a concrete program for addressing these difficulties, but I would say that at least at a minimum, um, they would warn us not to expect from any election done in this way whatsoever, that it will deliver us from the economic, political, and ideological crises and disasters of capitalism. So it would be uh, a cautionary note to adjust your expectations, you know, even if Trump does indeed get voted out and there's not mass scale civil unrest or an attempt at a coup, um, don't expect that we're going to, uh, you know, be getting out of many of the conundrums that we were already in even before Trump came to power. So perhaps, you know, that's my stab at a rather, you know, what I think is a, a nice timely feature of, of some of this material that's not as well trodden ground as say Hegel on the purple, you know, and I think that's very important to I me, mean, the topic of wealth inequality, but I wanted to choose something which perhaps hadn't got covered as much because a lot of people who defend Hegel are worried, I think, about defending his critique of voting because it seems to re 
reinforce the caricature of him as a totalitarian thinker, whether by Marxists like Popper or even some Western Marxists, uh, you know, suggesting that Hegel is harshly critical of a widely accepted democratic practice often brings with it the fear that, oh, you'll be, you know, you'll be playing into the hands of those who want to tar and feather him as, a, as an authoritarian minded uh, philosopher. But anyhow, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. And now lastly, we'll move on to Jensen. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, thank you for everyone who's tuned in to listen to us and thank you to all the other panelists. Uh, before I start um, reading my comments, just wanted to briefly note that um, uh, within Platypus over the past couple of years, um, there's been an ongoing conversation surrounding uh, the issue of Hegel and Marxism and philosophy and Marxism more generally. Uh, so some of what I'm gonna talk about and probably what we'll talk about in the um, Q&A uh, will derive from those internal conversations, which of course have um, broader significance. Hegel was a white man born in late 18th century Prussia who believed that European and specifically Germanic culture was the culminating achievement of human history. Hegel believed in the primacy of the West over the East, affirmed inequality in modern society as a necessary evil, held views about differences among the races that would widely be considered racist today, and celebrated the Prussian monarchy as the highest form of civil association. Things get even worse. Hegel believed that history has a teleological shape, that the direction of its development has been necessary, and that the motor driving the process of history is the ideal of freedom not equality, diversity, or even democracy, but freedom, an ideal now largely associated with the libertarian wing of the right. This process, moreover, is the result for Hegel of the activity of a collective form called Geist, or spirit, which does its work behind our backs and uses our own desires and aspirations as means for its own end of forcing us to be free. Voltaire, in questioning the theodicy of Leibniz, who also believed that history follows a necessary path, raised the Lisbon earthquake as counterproof of Leibnizian providence. How could such an unmitigated disaster, which killed tens of thousands of people, serve any rational purpose? Given the ongoing global pandemic, which has killed hundreds of thousands of people in the US alone, and unlike the Lisbon earthquake, was at least in part a result of human activity, how can we possibly follow Hegel in affirming the actual as the rational? Even Robert Pippin, Hegel's greatest living proponent, arguably, has recently implied that Trump's election cast serious doubt on the existence of even any traces of reason in the world. Such claims are nothing new, and after even the briefest glance at the major events of the 20th century can seem a bit hysterical. As Adorno pointed out 70 years ago, Auschwitz already appeared to give the lie to Hegelian metaphysics, proving beyond a doubt that the rationality of history could no longer be taken for granted. Otherwise, we would be forced to say that the Holocaust was unavoidable, a requisite learning lesson and necessary sacrifice for spirit on the road to higher freedom. What are we to make of a thinker like Hegel in the present? What purpose can Hegel possibly serve? Our sensibilities today, rehabituated by the ongoing collective and mandatory diversity and sensitivity training via the academy, social media, and traditional news media organizations like the failing New York Times in the immortal words of our current president, are scandalized by Hegel perhaps the whitest and the deadest of the dead white men. Following the postmodernists, the left has, for the most part, relegated Hegel to the, to the dustbin of history, while Hegel seems to persist mostly as an object of inquiry for the most specialized of the specialists, professional analytic philosophers, and the occasional continental heretic. What, if anything, can Hegel teach the contemporary left? This year marks the 250th anniversary of Hegel's birth, just six years shy of the semi-quincentennial of the United States, whose revolutionary founding has itself in recent years been deeply contested, with the year 1619 proposed by the newspaper of record as an alternative founding date. The abandonment of Hegel and the abandonment of the American founding are not unrelated. They both reflect a more fundamental referendum on the bourgeois revolution itself, for which Hegel functioned as the greatest philosophical cheerleader and spokesman. So the question concerning what Hegel has to teach the left is inseparably bound up with the question of whether and how the bourgeois revolution might continue to task leftism. I sketched above the sort of fairground caricature of Hegel that has circulated among his detractors for many decades, really centuries. 
This official Hegel, however, has little to do with the historical thinker who must be rescued, as Adorno points out. What the left is actually giving up is not the bad racist teleological metaphysician, but the most rigorous thinker of the logic of emancipation the world has ever known. And that includes Marx, who is not Hegel's practice oriented antithesis, but rather his greatest student. But before I say something about Hegel's logic of emancipation or logic of freedom, I first want to answer a different question. What exactly does Adorno mean by saying that Hegel must be rescued? And does Adorno's model of Rettung remain adequate to the task of redeeming Hegel for leftism? Adorno begins his short book on Hegel, Hegel Three Studies, with an admonition. Instead of asking what is dead or alive in Hegel and cherry picking concepts based on current theoretical interests or needs, as if philosophies were just idiosyncratic worldviews with neither internal necessity nor necessity in relation to social and historical reality. Instead, we must rather ask, quote, what the present means in the face of Hegel, whether perhaps the reason one imagines one has attained since Hegel's absolute reason has not in fact long since regressed behind the latter and accommodated to what merely exists, unquote. We must take Hegel at his word and take as our starting point his, his own claim that in modernity, the system of reason has been realized. Does the present historical situation vindicate Hegel's thought? Does Hegel's system as an aspect of bourgeois reality live up to its own claims to coherence, rationality, and absoluteness? As Adorno argues, not only does late capitalist society fall below Hegel's pronouncement that the concept of right has in the modern family, civil society, and the state been adequately realized. Hegel's attempt to articulate realized right philosophically also manifests the contradictions internal to bourgeois society under capitalism. What then does it mean to rescue Hegel for Adorno? Towards the end of the second essay in his Hegel book, Adorno puts it like this, quote, rescuing Hegel and only rescue, not revival is appropriate for him means facing up to his philosophy where it is most painful and wresting truth from where its untruth is obvious, unquote. For Adorno, facing up to such painful moments of untruth means tracing those instances where Hegel's own commitment to reason and universal freedom falters. For example, what Adorno refers to as the logical stringency of Hegel's system and its pretensions to total integration are, quote, untrue in the face of the Kantian discontinuities, discontinuities, unquote. That is, Adorno upholds Kant's assertion of the non-identity of the categories of thought with things in themselves, arguing that such non-identity holds open what Hegel's identity thesis shuts down, namely the possibility that things might be otherwise. By the same token, the untruth of Hegel's system is true as a testament to the untruth of the administered system of capitalist reality. This is the truth in Hegel's untruth, Adorno writes. The force of the whole which it mobilizes is not a mere fantasy on the part of spirit. It is the force of the real web of illusion in which all existence remains trapped." Unquote. Rescuing Hegel on Adorno's view is thus a complex operation that enables us to measure both Hegel and through him bourgeois society against themselves. But there is another less pronounced dimension of Adorno's account that gestures towards a different way of undertaking a retum of Hegel. This other dimension is implicit in what is perhaps Adorno's most famous rejoinder to Hegel from Minima Moralia. The whole is the untrue. Teasing out the implications of this aphorism in his Hegel book, Adorno writes in a passage worth quoting in full, that quote, by specifying in opposition to Hegel, the, the negativity of the whole, philosophy satisfies for the last time the postulate of determinate negation, which is a positing. The ray of light that reveals the whole to be untrue in all its moments is none other than utopia, the utopia of the whole truth, which is still to be realized." Unquote. This is an astonishing moment in Adorno. First, he notes that for the last time, philosophy satisfies the postulate of determinate negation. Why for the last time? Because, he goes on to write, the ray of light that reveals the whole to be true is none other than that of the whole truth. This would imply that the claim that the whole is the untrue has as its necessary correlate, the original Hegelian dictum that the true is the whole. Since it is only in light of what finally ought to be Adorno's utopia, that the untruth of the whole of capitalist bourgeois society is intelligible in the first place. 
But if this is so, then we are recalled to Hegel at a higher level, since his own ideal of the realized totality, an integral form of life, a utopia that coheres, remains indispensable. As Adorno himself demonstrates, there is a deep sense in which any politics of emancipation must keep faith with Hegel's own notions of reason, freedom, and totality. Accordingly, I want to end my opening remarks by saying a few words about the nature of the indispensability of such Hegelian notions. First, as Lukács pointed out long ago, without the Hegelian notion of totality, Marxism becomes a moralism, criticizing society from the outside. The category of totality enables us to grasp both why history as a whole has unfolded in the way that it has, why that society has that form of art, that form of religion, and that form of politics, and how such developments can be understood as developments, as ways of responding to the inadequacies of prior historical practices. The Hegelian category of totality gives us a way to understand the content of society and history in its determinacy, but also a way to measure society against itself. Second, as Hegel tells us, the rational is the actual and the actual is the rational. Every historical totality is governed by constitutive standards that determine what ought to be done and believed. What Adorno's invocation of Hegel's notion of the whole revealed is how deeply dependent Marxism remains at its core on the Hegelian logic, the ultimate aim of which is to grasp the actuality of things, what things are in truth, as when we ask whether a machine with artificial intelligence is actually thinking, or whether a philosopher is just a sophist or is actually doing philosophy. Hegel's logic of actuality enables us to grasp things in light of their inner dynamism and to measure them against their own truth. And third, and finally, Hegel argues that the notion of freedom is the truth of history. All past forms of life are failed attempts, however deeply implicitly, to actualize human freedom. Reason comes into its own, fulfills itself as reason, only once it is free, which for Hegel means we recognize neither God nor nature as the source of the authority of the laws that bind us, but only ourselves. Such mutual recognition of our responsibility for and authority over the life that we share must be embodied in our most fundamental institutions from the family to the state. And as the unavoidability of the category of the whole suggested above, Marxism itself must ask whether freedom in bourgeois society is actually freedom, whether something further is not required to realize the value of freedom we have come to recognize in modernity. Without Hegel's rational historicism, we have no way to hold society to account for its historical irrationalism. Even the task of criticizing Hegel, of holding Hegel to account for his own socially conformist apologetics, requires that we measure his thought against the standard of universal freedom Hegel himself brought to consciousness. To recognize capitalism as the, as the profound dysfunction of the bourgeois organism is to recognize the bourgeois principle of individual freedom and collective self-determination as lodestars for any possible quest for social emancipation. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, now we'll have time for responses and I'd like you to keep them at about three minutes. We're probably going to start with Andy, but before we um, start, I'm just going to give the audience a quick reminder. You can begin submitting your questions in the Q&A box. If your question is directed at one of the panelists in particular, please indicate that, that in your question. And you can also raise your hand and then I'll just call on you and um, allow you to say your question. I want to remind you all that because we're using Zoom, uh, questions will appear to panelists in the Q&A box before they're read aloud. But in order for the audience to know what the questions are, I'll ask the panelists to please hold off on your comments on each question until I've read it um, and the responses that are coming up. All right, so um, I just wanted to put this on the table. We'll do responses and feel free, free to address those or not to address those. Uh, we'll do responses in the order that you, oh, sorry. I just want to raise a couple of points of contention first. Um, First of all, uh, Andy, uh, you mentioned the value and essentially um, the conformity of cultural psychology, namely through Vygotsky uh, with Hegelian philosophy um, as a means of using this being used to basically elucidate different modes of practical action in the present. And you as well, um, uh, Adrian, have mentioned the value of Hegel's, uh, or rather Hegel's theory of private property and his criticisms of the one vote system um, and their implementations towards like a sort of analysis of the present. Whereas uh, Henry, you mentioned that um, 
you mentioned that basically as, a, as in the wake of the failure of Marxism, which Adorno and these critical theorists are identifying, um, we have this process of regression. Uh, and Jensen, you sort of elaborated on a similar point, even a little further and said that rather than judge Hegel in light of the present, we must understand how the present can sort of be evaluated in light of Hegel. And I just wanted to point out, you know, this sort of dynamic between on the one hand, Hegel and the present on the other, the present and Hegel, I guess. Uh, so Andy, if you want to go first with your response, that'd be great. And then uh, here we go. Andy, I think you're muted. I was waiting for you to unmute me, Justin. Um, a couple of questions to each of the other presenters. Um, Henry, I can understand why Adorno and his um, colleagues were interested in explaining political and cultural regression and why uh, they and maybe you were interested in understanding domination. But could I put it to you that it might be more useful in our time trying to understand uh, solidarity and collaboration, because as Marx said in founding the International Working Man's Association, that the failure of socialism so far was due to a lack of solidarity. Uh, and that's certainly the focus of my work is the development of collaboration, not the explaining of um, domination. So I can understand why people want to do that. Uh, Adrian, um, you're speaking from America. Could I just put it to you that maybe uh, the maybe a little bit more one person, one vote rather than less uh, would probably solve a hell of a lot of your problems. Um, the, I find it a strange moment uh, to be arguing uh, against the idea of, of everyone having an equal vote. Um, and just in a similar vein, uh, I mean, you're really finding private property in the sense in which Hegel is talking about it like the right to own the tools of your own trade is a problem, right? Uh, now, of course, uh, large scale uh, manufacture was a problem in Hegel's view as well. He didn't defend the right of factory owners to own the tools of somebody else's trade. He actually made an issue. Pri the right to private property is the right to own your own tools. I think that's a good idea. Obviously, it presents us some problems in a large scale post industrial globalized uh, society, but it seems like a good value, along with the possibility that, you know, of, how can I put it? Anyway, that's that. Uh, Jensen, um, the, it's hard sometimes to know whether you're putting your own view. Uh, or what your own view is, because you, you, you'll cite Adorno or Pippin to make a point. And I, I wonder, well, do you agree with Pippin that, that whether uh, rationality exists in the world is open to question uh, or so on? And it seems to me that the, several times that you posed the question of the rational, you, you did exactly uh, what Hegel asked us not to do, and that's to bring a concept of rational external to the world and then compare the world with it. So here's what I think is rational. Is the world rational? Oh, no, it isn't. And this is exactly the advice that Hegel gives is not to do. Now, of course, maybe you don't agree with uh, what Pippin said, probably ironically, quite honestly, Robert Pippin is a good Hegelian and doesn't do that. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you don't agree with Adorno either. Um, but I think if that's the case, you need to make it clear. Um, the, 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 there is no rationality other than in the unfolding of, of, of human activity. There's no external standard to it. The point of us uh, is to understand it. Yeah. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Uh, OK, so would Adrian or Jensen, would you like to respond? How about, you go ahead, Adrian. Oh, sure. Well, I'll be very brief apropos the one person, one vote uh, question that, that Andy directed to me. Um, now, of course, if what you're concerned with is 
a short-term outcome that prioritizes getting Donald Trump out of office at all costs. Well, yes, I would agree with you that there, you know, an increased amount of uh, enfranchisement of voters on the one vote, one person, one vote model would indeed be the priority. Um, but I think that, you know, but for with both Hegel and Marx, I mean, they are each stepping back and looking at this from a perspective that isn't, of course, just tied to the, you know, every few year ritual of voting. I mean, Hegel even talks about this as, all right, well, we leave things up to chance. And, you know, every X number of years, people go to the polls. And, you know, based on a lot of you know, not actual as rational, but rather what Hegel would just say would be merely matters of Dasein or existence, mere being there or existence as the crapshoot contingencies of the moment. And of course, it's no accident that in our politics, things like October surprises can sometimes, you know, cause the seismic needle uh, that is registered once every four years to fluctuate one way rather than another. Um, but Hegel says that's leaving the odd up to chance and is a problem. And of course, he would even say here, we're hoping for one person, one vote to deliver us from the mess that one person from what one person, one vote delivered us into to begin with. But at a bigger picture level, um, I think that for him, the, the, the greater sickness that afflicts societies uh, in the modern era is this hyper individualism that's very much bound up with conceptions of property, ownership, private mindness, etc. cetera. Um, and that this malaise in his view is going to be reinforced rather than ameliorated by the one person, one vote model. And that of course his alternative is to plead time and again for the more, the greater organic unity of what he sometimes calls the states and then in the philosophy of right calls corporations, which are of course uh, associations that would be closer to in the labor movement, things like unions or even Soviets. Now, of course, we're not going to get a, mo a reform that would you know, usher in say delegates from different you know, groups along the estates or corporations model uh, to be, you know, uh, you know, participate in a collected decision making in a legislative body. Um, that's the sort of change that would require a revolution or would be forced by the collapse of the existing, you know, state of affairs. Um, but I think that, you know, in the, at the larger level, again, both Hegel and Marx would say, don't think that Joe Biden or, you know, Kamala Harris or whoever, you know, brought to power through the, this particular kind of electoral process is going to deliver us any kind of serious remedy for what ails us in terms of modern and capitalism, but I'll leave things there. Uh, now you, Jensen? Yes. Um, well, the first thing I would say is that, uh, yes, I agree with Andy that um, the sort of rationality at issue is not external, but that's also what I was trying to emphasize, the rationality for Hegel is a matter of constitutive standards. So there are the standards to which we bind ourselves. It's not a matter of you know, an external principle against which uh, we're falling short. Um, with, uh, yeah, the, the ways in which I disagree with Pippin and uh, Adorno are slightly different, um, but in Pippin's case, you know, I, I think that that's just uh, you know, his own, uh, I mean, I take it that his claim is that um, bourgeois society has fallen so far below its own principles um, that there's no real way in which it can even be said to believe in them anymore. So the claim isn't that uh, there is some external mode of rationality, you know, that um, bourgeois society is failing to fulfill, but rather that, you know, he sees something like Trump's election as uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the ultimate um, uh, abandonment of bourgeois society's own original promise or something like that. I mean, I, I don't agree with Pippin on this at all. Uh, I mean, I just think this is an expression of a distinct kind of historical despair on his part. Um, uh, then with respect to Adorno, I think the issue there is slightly different because Adorno very much is, um, you know, uh, affirming the idea of imminent critique as, as the only possible model of uh, critique. Um, where, yeah, I would sort of depart from what Adorno has to say has to do with the particulars of um, his criticism of Hegel that, you know, that the more appropriate 
that there's a way that that um, uh, that there's a way that Kant's model of rationality in the first critique is in some way more adequate to our historical situation than Hegel's. This is what Adorno holds that you know that there's an honesty to Kant's you know belief in the ultimate unknowability of things as they are uh, that the sort of arrogance of Hegelian philosophy violates. Um, you know, I think that's a slightly different issue than you were asking about, but that's that's the point at which I would disagree with Adorno. Maybe we can get into the specifics of that, but I just wanted to answer the question about constitutive standards because, yeah, I, I completely follow Hegel that the only sorts of standards relevant are the ones that we they give to ourselves. Um, and that's the standpoint from which critique has to be undertaken. Okay, now Henry. Oh, you're muted. Uh, should I respond to Andy or just introduce my own my own uh, thoughts? Oh, uh, it's your choice. If you want, you can you can introduce your own thoughts, or you can just respond. Okay. Um, so for Andy, yeah, I found I found your your comments, your thoughts, really interesting. Uh, I, I'm also um, coming at them from a position of ignorance in the sense I haven't read Leontiev, but I'm wondering with Vygotsky, you, you said that there was no evidence that he had directly read Hegel. But I'm wondering whether uh, he had read Aristotle and whether that might be a point of triangulation between Vygotsky and Hegel regarding activity and um, and cultural psychology. Um, so that that's just sort of a naive question, basically. Um, Adrian, regarding um, sociopolitical thought, let me just review my notes. Um, Yeah, I think you put your finger on something. Um, and I wanted to ask whether you might want to generalize it to talk about something like the evacuation of the civic in modernity, right? So the idea that um, not only does voting become this, this sort of artificial four-year ritual, but that the activities that um, elevate individuals above civil society into the realm of the state are becoming fewer and fewer and more and more ateliated. Um, so, you know, paying taxes and maybe military conscription are about it. Um, and on top of that, I mean, I, I had an interesting conversation recently. If you listen to military people, I mean, we don't even know we're at war now, right? I mean, we, our students now for the first time are war babies and we have to explain to them that concept because it, they, they see nothing of it. Uh, and if you ask someone in the military why they're serving, there are two almost contradictory explanations that come to the fore. The one is I'm serving my country, which is the old pro patria mori that Hegel would fully embrace and say, yes, everyone should man the bridge when necessary. And the other is, it's an investment in myself, precisely this management of one's own assets that I'm getting a college degree out of this or some training that's gonna lift me out of poverty. And those two just clash often in the same person in the same discourse. And I think being sensitive to that allows us to generalize the point you're making in a way that um, hopefully might, might, might produce something. Um, then the other question I had is, and this may be a, a misunderstanding on my part, this is a minor point, but um, the idea of, of private property being a driver and you linking that to Marx, there are obviously passages where Marx sort of locates private property being the agent of alienation, but there's others like the German ideology where it's division of labor. And so how those two might relate, I'd be really interesting in hearing, especially in, in regard to, um, to Hegel. Does he talk about the division of labor as, a, as productive of a kind of social dissolution, um, not unlike Marx? Um, Jensen, there's so much in what you write, geez. Um, uh, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of it. I would introduce a couple of, of points where I would wanna hear more. One is, that as I said in my own talk too, I think that there is this inheritance of, of um, concepts that have, have a normative function from German idealism that Adorno still wants to actuate in some sense, um, freedom being one of them. Um, 
But on the other hand, in minimum moralia, one of his claims is that the concept of individuality itself is waning or is no longer uh, no longer obtains under contemporary late capitalism. Um, so I wonder whether there's um, there's more differentiation that has to be has to be made there. It's not clear to me uh, that Adorno is calling for individualism being being remaining a normative concept given the uh, societal situation we're in. Um, the second question, the other question I had is, is if I understood you correctly, you, I think we're implying that um, with uh, the whole is the untruth, is the untrue, um, Adorno has to presuppose a filled in concept of what the true whole would be in order to um, make that judgment. And I'm not sure about that. I would want to push back a little bit on that. Um, his understanding of determinate negation is not that it necessarily yields a determinate positive, uh, but it yields what might, might be called a, a differential better, something that's that's not not the negative, uh, but not necessarily um, an explicit positive. That fits with his build for both in that language as well. And then it also brought to mind the conclusion of minimum morality, the final section where he talks again about sort of the ray of, of utopia, but he does that, he says, in the face of despair, which indicates that the cognitive move might be fulfilling a non-cognitive function rather than a cognitive function. That is, it's meant to seduce us into continuing to resist or continuing to, maintain, to, to take a negative attitude towards the actual that is, rather than having a picture of what uh, the utopian standpoint would be such that we can criticize the present. So that's just a couple of provocative thoughts. Um, I really enjoyed all of these these talks immensely. Thank you so much. All right. So thank you so much to all our panelists. Now we're going to open up the Q&A. And there's two ways you can ask questions. You can put a question in the Q&A box, and I'll read it aloud. Or alternatively, you can raise your hand, and you'll be recognized to give your question. So I wanted to start first with Aaron. Oh, great. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So thank you, everybody, um, for your presentations. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, about what the role uh, or hmm, what is the political task of the present or what's the political task of capitalism? And I promise this relates to what you said about Hegel. Um, and the reason I'm asking this is because it seems to me, both from my own reading and from your presentations, um, that Hegel's writing met a certain political task of his time uh, to further the revolution of society, to further the bourgeois revolution. And it has also seemed to me that in the presentations today, some sort of idea of a political task in the present has kind of spontaneously come up. There have been a few um, to get Donald Trump out of office, um, to restore uh, the civic. Um, you know, which of course uh, conservative liberals today have also taken it upon themselves to try and restore the political community. Um, and there are others to uphold utopia, for example. Um, and uh, I was wondering um, how we might think about the political task of the present and of capitalism um, in relation to the one um, that Hegel was meeting and how it might be similar or how it might be different. Um, and of course, I think this raises Marx, um, who, you know, in observing, for example, the 1848 revolution in France, but also elsewhere throughout Europe, um, remarked on how the uh, revolution of what was once the people, right, for self-determination and for freedom um, became self-contradictory, um, which was objectified in the struggle of classes, the class struggle, the, uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Um, that's just one example of, I think, how uh, Marx, even though he took up Hegel, seems to be pointing to um, a changed uh, political task. So I wondered if, uh, with regards to the question about the um, importance of Hegel for the left today, uh, you all could elaborate on what you think the political task of the present is. Thank you. I'll have a go at that. Okay, that's good. Um, firstly, if we ask what is the task, we have to have a real subject in mind. You know, I don't think you can say that the, ta the task of the present epoch or the people or capitalism is this or that, right? So I'll have to answer it uh, as best I can. What is the task of the left? Now, the left barely writes 
as a subject today. And I understand that's sort of part of the, the uh, role of platypus to deal with that. Um, but the, the, the present task as, I, as socialist, I approach this way. Like Hegel, I look at that abstraction socialism and I, I try and understand it through analysis to it's that concrete simple something which is socialism and that's the relation of solidarity. Solidarity is a relationship between uh, uh, one subject and another when a subject places their themselves under the direction of another in order to support them as opposed to doing a deal or of trying to take them over or lead them somewhere. Solidarity means, what can I do to help you? I place myself at your disposal. I'm not in competition with you. I may not agree with you, but I think you have a right to exist. What can I do to assist you? This is sorely lacking. Now, in the conversation so far, there was, I have to say, a strongly American flavor to the way you talk about the current epoch, uh, which bodes ill for the rest of the world because what is America today can often be uh, the rest of the world tomorrow. Uh, but is it, can it be more obvious than in America, the need for solidarity? And, and, and uh, by taking that abstraction, reducing it to that concrete, simple something of a relationship between two subjects, uh, that's something I get from Hegel. So then I proceed accordingly to try and build uh, and proliferate relationships of solidarity. If every if solidarity was universal, we would have socialism. Never mind the institutions. Henry, oh Jensen, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, this I also wanted to respond uh, to something that Andy had said earlier. Uh, that in a sense, despite the emphasis on solidarity as quite a concrete something, it strikes me as, in a, in a way, quite an abstract uh, ideal. Um, I mean, when you said before that, well, why don't we focus on solidarity instead of regression? Um, that seems to betray, in a way, uh, uh, maybe an insensitivity to the particulars of the situation, because of the historical situation. Because if there are real obstacles or there are real blocks that present prevent the formation of solidarity, whatever that might mean, um, we can't just say, you know, why not look at the glasses, you know, half full instead of half empty. It just seems a little too irenic of an approach to say that um, we should push for solidarity instead of analysis of regression, uh, or that should be the political aim come what may, uh, because there are real obstacles to, um, uh, uh, to the uh, to, to solidarity, and I think this also speaks in a way to the question that that Aaron raised um, that it's very difficult to formulate a concrete political task for precisely because of these blocks, which is what forces Adorno back on the language of um, of utopia. Uh, so if if in Hegel's moment um, the way that he understood his own project was primarily as a retrospective and justificatory one that um not exactly as if he's taking a victory lap but you know um because hegel did see real problems uh with the institutions of his moment but at the same time he basically saw those institutions as rational and necessary um and the role that philosophy was to play was his rational comprehension that uh philosophy was in the unique position of actually understanding why we have the institutions that we do and of justifying why these institutions are the ones that we must have. Um, obviously, after Marx, uh, that that line of thought is um, is called into to question, um, and there was a possibility for a real formulation of a political task and concrete forms of solidarity. Um, you know, in the years shortly after Hegel's death in the the forties and the fifties. Um, today, I guess you know. Uh, it's difficult to formulate a political task, but for that very reason, I also think we have to be careful um, about projecting abstractions like solidarity, which can actually blind us to, uh, you know, real 
obstacles to the formation of um, solidarity. So that's just one general uh, response to Aaron's question and to uh, Andy. Henry, do you want to go ahead? You're muted. Uh, that's a very big question. I'll take a couple of small bites at it. Um, um, so Marx in his, uh, in his comments on Mill gives a very abstract model for what he calls social production, which is producing uh, for use rather than producing for exchange. And I wonder whether that isn't um, a model for the type of solidarity that Andy's talking about. Uh, and if so, then I, I would be a little more optimistic and say that there are in the American context places where that has happened. Um, thinking about um, the achievements of um, you know, gay marriage and sort of rights in the past decades or so that have been formed with those kinds of um, recognitional solidarities, call it that. Because I think part of that model of um, reciprocal production for use that Marx is talking about in Mill is one that confers a status of recognition. This is a very Hegelian moment in Marx, I think. Um, so looking for ways, uh, even locally, to generate those kinds of practices, that is where there is cooperative and collaborative activity. I don't wanna, I don't wanna privilege production the way Marx does, but co co collective and cooperative activity that confers status upon the participants is one way of building solidarity. So in the wake, in the wake of Trump's election, you know the 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 uh, the marches that happened around the two hundred eight the two thousand eight midterm elections are examples of those types of recognitional activities, in my view, and I think that's a that's a an interesting possibility. Now that runs against the kinds of obstacles that, that Jensen may be referring to, which is you know dark money, money gerrymandering, all the all the structural impediments to translating those kinds of grassroots solidaristic activities into uh, institutional effect. And I think that might be where um, some energy could be devoted. So I'll stop there. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, just to come back on what Jensen said, solidarity may be to you an abstraction and certainly starts that way. But to follow Hegel, uh, we don't leave it as an abstraction. Through analysis, you determine it uh, as that concrete, simple something. Uh, I went to the length of explaining that when I say solidarity, I mean one subject offering its services to another to work under their direction. You, of course, right, there are barriers to solidarity. That's my whole point. Yeah. So if someone is blocked from participation in political life, uh, the solidarity, the principle, the duty of solidarity is to offer yourself to work under their direction. To say, I have these resources, how would you like to use them? It's a specific meaning. It's a relation between two subjects. It's not an abstraction. And I would re if Hegel is to offer anything to the left, it's to show you how to break down these abstractions, stop working with abstractions, analyze them, to a point where you're able to make a dialectical reconstruction of the way Marx did in his critique of political economy. But it doesn't have to be confined to political economy. You can approach any question. An intersectionality, for example, uh, one of the issues in um, America today is something that can be approached in that way and is being approached by young people on the left today in that concrete way. Um, Adrian. All right. So yes, to uh, speak to Aaron's question, uh, first of all, one of the things that I find uh, very uh, resonant in terms of the contemporary situation of the left, in terms of Hegel's perspective, and here Hegel more so than Marx, um, is that. Uh, you know, of course, the very question itself, you know, asks about, you know, in a way, 
political plans or projects that as such are oriented toward the future. All right, what specific steps should we take in order to move forward and make progress judged by some standard? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, behind that, I'm not, I don't think that the question necessarily is meaning to imply this, but, you know, there's often a, a, a perspective that involves a kind of ideological blackmail in which uh, leftists are told, well, if you don't have, you know, any concrete policy proposals, you know, realistic solutions or alternatives that you can put on the table, basically you should shut up. You don't have a right to engage in a criticism of the status quo if you don't have some sort of you know, magic bullet tucked away in your back pocket ready to offer as the alternative. Um, and I think we need to really resist that and to say, you know, uh, and to be able to own up to the fact that, uh, you know, we, unlike a certain classical historical materialism, which laid claim to certain, however, you know, rough, loose, approximate, etc., to quasi-scientific uh, predictive powers and an ability to forecast the future of social history, um, that we are really more in the situation that is already implied by Hegel with the figure of the Owl of Minerva at the end of the justly celebrated preface to 1821's Philosophy of Right, which is that, um, you know, we can survey the past and, you know, the past as it leads up to our present, but uh, we are powerless to see into the future and to, you know, make predictions about um, the, uh, you know, inherently unpredictable twists and turns of the subsequent course of social history. And here within Marxism, I mean, I think it's really left to figures such as, I mean, the one that jumps to mind most readily here would be the, the Benjamin of uh, theses on the philosophy of history. Uh, you know, and I, I interpret, you know, his uh, image or figure of the angel of history as in a way a kind of, uh, uh, you know, 20th century redeployment of Hegel's Owl of Minerva, that this owl and that angel are almost like, you know, avian relatives. Um, and that, of course, you know, what Benjamin is emphasizing is as historical materialists, we have to operate without that enlightenment style notion of a certain arc of history that when we interpret it appropriately gives us this predictive power which we actually don't enjoy that we are being you know pushed into the future with our backs turned towards it and i think that hegel and benjamin here contra a certain kind of classical uh marxism which i do think marx himself sometimes subscribed to as a child of the enlightenment but of course is associated with you know engels's codification of marx's historical materialism and a number of uh you know a number of of marxist orientations often seen as crude and vulgar, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Marx himself. Um, and I think that we need to have the sense that we are very much, uh, we have to, and we are right to criticize the internal inconsistencies, the contradictions, the self-destructive tendencies and dynamics of our status quo, um, even if, uh, you know, we aren't able to say, okay, here's what we should do to resolve these, or here are the steps or the, you know, particular measures that we could take to move beyond these impasses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, more, more concrete measures, I mean, sure, I could, you know, Know, shoot from the hip here and spell out certain things which I think would be, you know, better policy choices in the near term future. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I you know, and that in some of these could be tied quite closely to Hegel and or Marx. Um, but, you know, I, what I don't want to lose sight of is that even if we can't do that, or even if, you know, these, these proposals are unrealistic, problematic, uh, you know, not adequately sketched out, etc., that they, we shouldn't be forced to have to proffer those in order to be entitled to engage in thoroughgoing, rigorous, stringent criticism of the failures of the status quo, regardless of whether or not we have, you know, a nice, neat, you know, alternative solution, you know, at hand to offer in its place. I'll, I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Richard, his question. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear me just fine. Yes, so I mean, to piggyback off Adrian Johnson's last comments about classical materialism and which uh, a certain vision which he attributed to Engels as opposed to Marx, I want to ask how all of the panelists understand the terms materialism and idealism and how they understand the classical opposition of Marx as a materialist against Hegel as an idealist with materialism being upheld against idealism and whether they see that as a vulgar opposition. And I guess in terms of the question of goals, 
I mean, obviously, politically, um, you know, Hegel would have been, let us say, a conservative liberal, whereas Marx was a revolutionary socialist. So I guess the question also for the panelists is, is the goal of revolutionary socialism in a classical Marxist sense, one that is still on the table? And I guess, I guess what I wanted was a discussion of not only the continuity between Marx and Hegel, but potential discontinuity and opposition. Go right ahead, Andy. And then after that, Jensen. Um, yeah, the, the first thing about the idealism and materialism thing is that this can't be understood on a single axis. There are multiple axes on which this distinction is being made. For example, um, Hegel introduced the idea that knowledge is socially determined. Now, modern materialists regard that as something that uh, is materialism, right? And it's the idealists that think that uh, ideas, uh, you know, sort of come out of the head, right? But in, when Hegel proposed uh, or defined idealism, um, it was to introduce this idea that knowledge is a social product. But I'll, I'll, one other aspect of this, uh, if you believe that uh, human-induced climate change is real, you are an idealist. Because I guarantee you didn't come to that conclusion through personal experience. You came to that conclusion because you trust science. And part of idealism is the belief that on the whole, institutions are true to their concept, right? So anyone that, that is, is not a climate denier, uh, if you're a belief in the science of, of climate change, then you're an idealist. So um, I've posted a link to an article I've written on this question, which identifies about uh, half a dozen different axes on which this distinction between idealism and materialism has to be viewed. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, I agree with Andy that this has to be understood on multiple axes. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously Hegel uh, is most famous for saying that philosophy is its own time grasped in thought. And what he meant by that is, you know, precisely that philosophy uh, reflects is the self comprehension of um, uh, a, a form of life, uh, you know, that has real um, uh, economic, civil, social, uh, uh, institutional forms. Um, so in that, that sense, uh, yes, the, the Hegel is already um, a materialist. And Hegel also says things like, you know, uh, in his lectures on aesthetics, Hegel says that um, life itself, you know, the activity of living beings is an objective idealism. Uh, so Hegel's own sense of idealism is, you know, that uh, concepts are constitutive of reality, which is different from saying that concepts produce reality. Uh, Hegel's making the uh, Aristotelian point that, you know, um, that, that um, objects have a, a purposive dynamic um, in light of their form. Um, so for Hegel, idealism is, is uh, it's not a, an abstraction, it's not a neoplatonic, you know, reality producing machine or something like that. Um, at the same time, I think that the point of discontinuity and the real force of the critique of Hegel's idealism, um, it's, it, it lies less on the, the side of metaphysics or logic or how Hegel understands reality. I think on that side, there's deep continuity between Marx and Hegel, that for all of what Marx has to say, that there are, uh, to the contrary, there are very few metaphysical disagreements between Hegel and Marx. I think where there is a, a deep discontinuity is um, in how Hegel understands um, the task of theory and philosophy and how Marx understands the task of theory and philosophy. As I said before, um, I mean, and Adrian brought up the, the famous, um, the Owl of Minerva line, Hegel understands philosophy primarily as a retrospective just, justificatory task 
you know, philosophy can't change the world, it, it can comprehend it. Um, Hegel does see that self-comprehension as a necessary aspect of any social reality and philosophy plays a necessary role in that way. But he also didn't think that, you know, philosophy had any uh, uh, real prospective power, um, material force or uh, practical force. And I think that this is, um, you know, that, that Marx's critique of uh, Hegel's retrospective justificatory paradigm of philosophy, Marx's understanding of, you know, philosophy as articulating real possibilities um, intrinsic to present political reality, uh, that that's what's truly distinctive about Marx's model. Um, and, uh, and that's in some ways what's really at stake in the distinction between materialism and idealism. I think the mistake is to think that uh, materialism in Marx's sense has, you know, um, uh, is developing a, a separate metaphysics or that there's a debate at that level. I think that's, you know, that's a, a black hole if one starts to uh, go down that, that track. Okay, so I wanted to also add to this question. Well, I wanted to ask Adrian and Henry, first Adrian, is there a discontinuity between Hegel and Marx? And if so, how is this relevant for the political task of the present? That's building on Richard's question. Okay, um, well, I wanted to also add to the discussion of, uh, you know, the the notion of the fundamental conflict between materialism and idealism as the primary contradiction of the history of Western philosophy as per the kind of classical and Gelsian thesis that then gets taken up primarily by Lenin and, you know, the Soviets in the 20th century. Um, that, uh, you know, and, and building on some of what has already been said, you know, for example, uh, Jensen's remarks, you know, indicated that when we talk about Hegel's idealism, we have to be very careful about how we construe that, because often when we use the word idealism, what, what we're really thinking of is a kind of psychological and or subjective idealism that involves the idea of, uh, you know, the mind either being the exclusive reality or having priority and, in a sense, imposing itself as, you know, the ultimate determinant of what counts as real and knowable. Um, and, of course, Hegel was a staunch opponent of these sorts of idealisms. And you know many of his uh, you know worries and criticisms of predecessors such as Kant and Fichte, you know, involved him spelling out the difference between, on the one hand, subjective idealism, a la the transcendental varieties of these predecessors, you know, and then you know his and Schelling's objective, and then Hegel's absolute idealisms uh, as very different here. And I think that's important to bear in mind. Um, but you know, furthermore, um, to cut and to cut a very long story very short, I think if you look at moments such as you know, when Hegel criticizes at least certain Schellingians, if not Schelling himself, in that famous moment, uh, in among many famous moments in the preface to 1807's Phenomenology of Spirit, in which Hegel famously talks about the need to think substance also as subject, um, that there's an interesting subterranean link between what is involved in that observation by Hegel uh, early in the phenomenology and what shows up, for instance, in, you know, of course, when we talk about Marx's 1845 theses on Feuerbach, you know, usually the first thing we think of is the 11th and final thesis, which obviously is getting repeatedly alluded to in these discussions in terms of the difference between comprehending versus changing the world. Um, but if you go back and you look at the first of the 11 theses on Feuerbach, you have uh, Marx spell out the difference between what he calls on the one hand contemplative materialism, which for Marx covers everything from the ancient Greek atomists that he wrote his dissertation on up to Feuerbach himself, versus this new form of materialism that Marx is trying to bring into the picture that would contain within itself uh, the category of subjective practice or activity, and not just, of course, this inert objectivity that everything gets reduced to all other contemplative standpoint. Um, and I think that there's very much the same sort of thing at stake in terms of, of Marx you know, talking about a materialism that would include the category of subjective practice, um, as there is in Hegel's notion of the need to think substance also as subject. 
And we have to remember that Hegel is the author not only of texts like the phenomenology, the logic, uh, the philosophy of right or the aesthetics, he also was the author of, among other things, the second volume of the encyclopedia, the philosophy of nature. He indeed had a natural philosophy, uh, contrary to what a lot of commentary would lead you to believe. And also the early moments of the third volume of the philosophy of mind, the Geistes philosophy, which involves his anthropology as the transition from animal organism to the distinctly human creature. Um, and that, you know, Hegel has a certain very qualified naturalism um, that we often lose sight of. And that is also that provides a number of openings that Marx was, you know, clearly aware of and that Engels and some of the Soviets capitalize on. And if you want the longer version of that story, I'm sorry, here's the shameless, you know, self-promotion plug. My most recent book that came out last year, the second volume of my prolegomena project, A Weak Nature Alone, tells the story of this development of a kind of Natu quasi naturalist materialism from Hegel himself, you know, across the arc of his intellectual itinerary onto Marxism in both its, you know, classical and then, you know, in the 20th century split into Eastern and Western currents. Um, and I think that there's a lot there which problematizes the idea that Hegel is to be squarely situated on the side of an idealism that is the diametrical opposite of a materialism in a, you know, history of philosophy structuring struggle. Um, as for the practical political differences between you know, Hegel and Marx, admittedly, there are a good number of these. And, you know, of course, you know, at the level of Hegel's personal political preferences, I mean, when we look at his correspondence, when we look at some of his journalism, how he reacted to especially what he was witnessing in terms of developments in revolutionary and post-revolutionary France, etc. Um, that, yes, I mean, there are various things that one could latch on to and say, you know, Hegel in certain ways was, you know, kind of a, a center leftist sort of, you know, bourgeois thinker. Um, but of course, what's most interesting about Hegel Hegel, like Hegel said of Kant when talking about the third critique, that Kant's most interesting at those moments when he reaches beyond himself. Um, you know, that there's so much in Hegel that involves him in a way reaching beyond himself, um, and especially in ways that, you know, some ways Marx appreciated, but then a lot of a lot of what you get in Hegel that's anticipatory of Marx, Marx didn't have access to. I mean, things, you know, that weren't published until the 1930s. Um, and, you know, in the in the line of, of someone like the, uh, you know, like the Lukács, who authors, the young Hegel, um, you know, doing this work in terms of being able to see that, especially given Hegel's and Marx's shared interests in classical political economy, uh, and, you know, in particular, the figure of Adam Smith and what they both extract from there, um, that there's a lot you can do with Hegel that kind of closes that gap between the two of them. Um, but that I do think one would have to, in the interest of honest intellectual history, say, in some cases, that does involve playing off certain moments in Hegel against others um, and not prioritizing in you know Hegel's own personal political convictions in terms of his responses to the events of his day. Um, so yeah, but uh, you know at the same time, the picture you get of Hegel is one that's not so easily seen as he was just wholeheartedly, uh, you know, nothing but a committed, you know, kind of centrist, you know, you know, not, of course, not, not at all Prussian authoritarian, but, you know, also he's not fully assimilable to just some kind of bourgeois sensibility in terms of a, a centrist political outlook that, uh, you know, we would consider to be, you know, entirely non-revolutionary. But I, I'll stop there. Go ahead, Henry. I'm going to take a micro view instead of Adrian's maximalist view. Um, so uh, in terms of Hegel and Marx, um, Maybe, maybe second nature might be a nice point to point to. So if you think about objective idealism for Hegel, that implies a kind of second nature, right? That we build these institutions that hopefully we feel at home in and, and, and almost forget that we've built them because we feel so at home there. But when Marx writes Capital, he talks about those structures and he says they're naturwuchsig, they're like nature or they grow like nature. And I think we're supposed to, meant, we're supposed to see that as a possible point of, of um, conflict. So to tie that in together um, with maybe Lukács, if you think about, and maybe going back to Andy on solidarity, if, if you take the idea that the second nature is one that we produced and have forgotten that we produce and actively reproduce it, so that it appears to us as material nature confronting us and alienating us, then Lukács comes along and says, well, what you have to do is raise the consciousness of the working class or the proletariat, because if you ask them, what are you producing? They'll say, I'm making a widget or I'm earning my daily wage. 
But if you read Marx, then you'll say, oh, I'm reproducing capital. I'm recreating precisely the natural world that I've been born into that oppresses me or with, with which I feel, I feel alienated. So in that case, it's idealistic in the sense that we're resurrecting Hegel's idea that we produce objective idealism collectively by the institutions we create, but they then confront us as reified, petrified things rather than the processes that we are actively reproducing every day. And if we can do that, then we, can we, then we can understand that we're all collective agents in doing that. And that might be the start to something like a political change. So that's trying to tie together some idealism and some materialism. I'll stop. You wanna go ahead, Jensen? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that uh, and this sort of goes back to um, something that Henry had said in response to, to me originally. Um, but it also seems that that, that idea in Hegel of um, being at home in one's institutions, um, you know, even if that's um, uh, under capitalism, if that's been falsified in some sense, uh, that still has to remain um, sort of the normative standard by which, you know, we would judge uh, what would be a truly adequate form of institutionality. So in that sense, I guess the, what you were calling Hegel's objective idealism. Um, I don't know that it can be played off against materialism ultimately, because even for an emancipated society, that sort of Hegelian notion will still would still have to be in play. Um, and likewise, this relates to, to your point from earlier about um, Adorno's remark that the whole is the untrue. Uh, in the passage that I quoted, what he actually says there, and I'll post this to the text box since it's not the easiest uh, thing to hear. Um, this is a partial quotation, but. Uh, there. Um, yeah, so I take it that, you know, when Adorno says that the ray of light that reveals the whole to be untrue in all its moments is none other than utopia, the utopia of the whole truth, which is still to be realized. Um, that notion of the utopia of the whole truth, that remains a normative standard in as much as, you know, uh, when, when we're asking about what would count as emancipation, I take it that we're not just saying, and this is part of the inheritance from Hegel, we're not just saying, well, what contingently would count as emancipation for us moderns? We're asking the question, what would count as freedom? What would it mean to achieve freedom? And that's part of what we inherit, inherit from the bourgeois revolution, the task of bourgeois society. Uh, and when Adorno says that this is the whole, the whole true, I, I take it that he is um, the whole truth. He's, he's adhering to that, that Hegelian legacy. Um, so I think that's one way in which uh, the Hegelian ideal of freedom and of totality uh, have to persist for Adorno's own critical criteria to make sense. Uh, in judging bourgeois society against itself, part of what we're asking is, well, what would constitute um, an actually coherent totality? What would constitute an actually free society? Uh, and I take that to be more or less consistent with what, what he's saying. He has to use the term utopia because he sees the possibility of concretely envisioning those institutions as blocked. But if utopia is a placeholder concept, it's a placeholder concept for this idea of realized freedom. Um, and lastly, just since I'm already on the topic of Henry's remarks, I just wanted to say that uh, in, in response that um, I wonder about, and I touched on this in, in my own remarks when I mentioned Adorno's relation to Kant, uh, but I guess I wonder if um, Adorno's identification of domination with identity thinking and with conceptuality, predication, judgment, those forms, uh, that this is not another sort of, that this is a sort of problem because Hegel operates with a different conception of conceptuality. I mean, Hegel makes a distinction between deductive reasoning and conceptuality proper, the conceptuality proper to Vernunft. And 
you know, for Hegel, the this, this sort of rationality that, that you know, the highest level of rationality is, you know, the sort of um, uh, concept that's uh, constitutive of a, of a living being, of a, of a life form. Uh, this is something he takes over from Aristotle. So for Hegel, when we want to know about concrete universality, you know, we ask what it would mean for a living being to meet its own standards, uh, for it to live up to its own concept. Um, and that's a very different notion of conceptuality than Adorno takes aim at. And there's often a tendency in Adorno to conflate these two conceptions of conceptuality, that there's not enough of a distinction between, because Hegel would agree with Adorno that there's a problem if, you know, you stop at that level of uh, Feshtan, if you stop and, you know, you reduce reasoning to instrumental reasoning or to deductive rationality. Um, but Hegel moves in the other direction of showing that, well, you know, we have to be committed to this higher conception of uh, what, what constitutes rationality. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to pose that as a potential problem for Adorno's critique um, that, you know, he doesn't abide by this distinction in, in Hegel, which is also there in a nascent form in Kant. Uh, and that seems to me to create some problems for, you know, uh, how he's going to ground even his own account, um, how he's going to ground the, the idea of conceptuality that he has to employ uh, in his own conception of, say, you know, the constitutive standards that um, he makes use of when he undertakes an imminent critique of an artwork or of society. That itself evinces a very different idea of uh, what counts as a concept. So. Okay. So um, now. Can I, can I respond briefly to that? Um, uh, I want to try out an idea on you, Jensen. Um, so this idea of light of, of the, the rationality of life forms, right? So if you think about um, the, a life cycle of, of, a given, of a given organism being described by, you know, how it moves, how it feeds, how it reproduces and so on, right? And you find all of those metaphors in Marx's Kapital. The Kapital is an organism, if you will, that sort of reproduces without natural limit. Um, and if you think about how one comes to understand uh, the life cycle or the natural history of a life form, uh, and empirically you do that by removing obstacles to its being able to find the right nutrition or reproduce in the right temperature or travel in the right migration patterns. You don't know those ahead of time. You learn them by removing the obstacles. And in doing that, you flesh out what would be an idealized um, life cycle for that life form. I want to suggest that that's the, the model of rationality at work in Adorno, that he's he's identifying obstacles to human flourishing without having to predefine what human flourishing is. And he has the roadmap to that by these bourgeois concepts that are not fully realized, that, uh, that en encounter obstacles. But what, those ob but what those concepts would actually be realized as once the obstacles are removed, he's, I think he's fairly agnostic about that. So that's just, a, that's just a wild idea I wanted to try on you for trying to flesh out um, uh, Adorno's thinking there and how he can embrace utopia without having to give actually a concrete vision to it. Thank you. Can I very okay. briefly respond to that? Go right ahead, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I would say that that's, um, it, to my mind, that's uh, very close, if not uh, exactly what Hegel is arguing for. I mean, if, if um, I mean, Hegel's pretty emphatic that, that you know, um, that there isn't a blueprint for realized rationality, but it's something that has to be um, constructed precisely through the historical attempt to realize freedom. Um, and then retrospectively, we can understand why, you know, practically it was necessary that things happen in the way that they did and why certain um, forms of social organization failed. Uh, but those partial, partial attempts at realization um, they are a part of what, you know, turns out to have constituted the content of uh, what would be true freedom. Um, and likewise, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that, um, uh, to echo what I said earlier in response to something that Andy said, that, you know, I don't think that, um, uh, that, there, can, that there is an external 
um, ideal or an external uh, set of criteria to which we can appeal in um, trying to give an account of what politically we should be aiming for. Uh, I think rather that, you know, it's that bourgeois society itself has set the task. It itself has established what those criteria are. And if we're not to beg questions, then, you know, those are the criteria that, um, you know, that we sort of have to examine. I mean, if we look at a category, you mentioned the category of individuality or individual freedom and whether that could sort of, you know, whether that is a, a criteria to be realized, a criterion to be realized in Adorno's case. But I take it that, that maybe the model is something like, you know, um, well, we come to be committed to the idea that everyone should have the right to lead a free life. Um, there's a certain way in which that's understood in bourgeois society. It's, it's inseparably bound up with, uh, you know, the bourgeois conception of property. Um, but we see that, you know, that conception of freedom is in another sense, it's inimical to the very ideal that it wants to realize that individual freedom is actually undermined by, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, industrial production, uh, post-industrial capitalist production. Uh, and that requires that we revise what, uh, what, tr what a true realization of the notion of individual freedom would mean. We are committed to that category. We take it to be essential to human flourishing that individuals have the right to lead a free life, but there's gonna, but we have to revise what it would mean to lead a free life. So I guess that sort of revision model that there has to be a determinant. It's not that we have a, a formal standard and we just need to, um, you know, that, that the same ideal uh, can be realized under different conditions, but the ideal itself requires revision or reformulation to be realized, yeah. Okay, so uh, we're bringing that back in with a life form that is abstract exchange relating to some of our earlier discussions. And I wanted to start by um, bringing up two questions in a row actually, first from Lee Turner and then from Lou S. Uh, so first of all, we have Lee Turner's question. Marx makes a distinction between value, production relation and exchange value, a market relation. Marxists often conflate these categories and do you contend that Adorno is guilty of such a categorical conflation? And next up, we have a question from Lou S, which is, uh, what are the political implications for the overcoming the exchange principle or bourgeois equality upon their own terms? And I wanted to address that to all the panelists. And I say we can start with Andy. All right. Um, the, the, I think the, the important thing is to try and build uh, perspectives on the basis of, of concrete relations. So uh, to tackle the question of a society which is based on the relationship, relation of exchange of commodities, it's easy to, well, it's not easy. You can form um, an alternative concept, which as I said, is the relationship of solidarity, but you don't necessarily start building institutions in the sky to try and realize that and say everybody has this right and, and so on. Uh, the, the, the way um, a simple relation which encapsulates the, 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 the tasks of um, socialism has to be realized in, in, a, in a real historical process, which is why famously Marx uh, had to wait to the Paris Commune before amending the, the um, Communist Manifesto in terms of uh, what the working class would do if it took state power. He didn't speculate on that. Um, so I think the, the, the approach is, is to understand this very simple person-to-person -person relation of solidarity and to look about you for where that is realized in some institutions are better than others or partially. You know, where there are really existing examples that are worth defending, that exist and are able to live uh, within this horrible capitalist society, right? Because um, a relation which is to overcome society, capitalism has to be able to survive within it. Um, so that's a, a couple of uh, guides, I would say, 
um, to uh, trying to overcome society based on commodity exchange. Uh, simply abolishing commodity exchange is not a good start, for example, but you can build on a, a, a real genuinely human relationship till it's capable of transcending and overcoming a relationship based on accumulation of wealth. Uh, Henry, do you want to go up next? Uh, sure. Um, so, so the question by Lou Turner asking about um, whether there's a conflation between value understood uh, in the production sphere, which I, I take it means something like the law of value or the labor theory of value versus exchange value in the sphere of circulation or exchange, um, and whether Adorno conflates those. Um, that's a tough question. I don't, I don't think he, I'd have to see specific passages. I think his target is, is different, which is what makes, um, ex, what kind of thought processes have to go in, into uh, the principle of exchange to, in the first place. And that he sees as being um, an abstract relation that renders incommensurables commensurable. That's maybe one way of putting it, that he's returning to that sort of Aristotelian problem that Marx uh, thought he had solved. Um, the person to go to to look for um, the really deep, deep um, consideration of these types of questions, I think, is the person from whom Adorno borrowed slash stole, which is Alfred Soldretel, um, where he really talks about the real abstraction. That's a term that comes from Alfred Soldretel. Um, and he, I think, teases out in one of his books precisely those relations that Adorno sort of either takes on board without acknowledging or doesn't pay a lot of attention to. Um, the idea that value is something abstract that allows for things that are concretely incommensurable in any dimension to be exchanged is the thing that, that lodged into uh, Adorno's thinking, I think, and that he saw as the real problem. So that's a way to kind of dodge and deflect uh, fully answering the question, but saying I think Sloan Rachel would be the one to look at. Um, in, in terms of overcoming exchange inequity, um, I think that Adorno's model of determinant negation is probably at work here, which is that in any specific exchange or any particular act of abstraction, the Adorno in, Adornoinian, the Adorno person, is going to want to point to what is being overlooked, what is incommensurable or non-identical. So he's going to accept an identity relation, but as it were, find the fulcrum by which it can be criticized and made better, differentially better, right? You think these, these, these two things are equal or exchangeable, but you're forgetting this dimension in which they're unequal and that needs to be brought in. So it's a perpetual, um, it's a perpetual correction on any kind of equivalence relation that uh, will drive what he, what he calls a negative dialectic. You'll constantly be looking for that distinction that will drive the next order of identity. Uh, sorry to take so long. And next up, Adrian. Well, I'll, I, instead of speaking to the specifically Adornian dimension of value, exchange value, et cetera, um, I, you know, in talking about the possible transformation of value and how it functions in its various guises, uh, and especially what we might be able to hope for uh, further down the road of social history, uh, I want to begin uh, by having recourse to, I think, a very helpful observation uh, from Zizek, who, when talking about the topic of utopia, differentiates between what we often understand by this term, and of course has its roots in things like, you know, the Callipolis at stake in Plato's Republic, um, but, you know, this, this, arm, this product of armchair speculation in which we allow ourselves to daydream and construct ideal models, uh, you know, as heavens which may or may not be able to be brought down to earth, etc. Um, and that, you know, any, any kind of utopia along those lines or any such utopianism in a way, at least from, I think, both a Hegelian and a Marxian standpoint, is really not worth wasting time thinking and talking about. Um, but there is another sense of utopia that, you know, Zizek highlights, which is the notion of, well, we may 
end up being able to arrive at utopia in terms of a radical transformation of our circumstances, not you know, thanks to having engaged in this armchair daydreaming that then we somehow managed to impose on things, but rather you know, when uh, you know, crises and catastrophes back us into a corner and when we're in such dire circumstances that we have to take a radical leap in a direction that before seemed you know, improbable or unfeasible to the point of practical impossibility um, and radically reinvent our way of life just to survive, right? And of course, you know, here we are in the context of, you know, a, a, a global health crisis, the likes of which we haven't seen in 102 years. Um, and you have, uh, you know, even, you know, those on the right being forced to contemplate measures that, you know, previously they would have just utterly rejected. I mean, things that begin to look like they're creeping in the direction of universal basic income, you know, or other Keynesian measures. And I think, for instance, uh, you know, that today's Republicans, in a way, might be afraid of holding on to power after this election, because as, uh, you know, as for instance, a University of Chicago economist right after the Great Recession a decade ago observed we're all Keynesians in the foxhole and that, uh, you know, they may be forced to take measures, you know, that before would have only appeared on something like Bernie Sanders policy wish list, um, simply as a matter of about a sheer desperation preventing the bottom of the economy from dropping out and things collapsing on their watch. Um, and I think if we're to hope for, you know, radical restructuring of, you know, because when we talk about especially exchange value and as it functions not only in relation to commodities purchased for private consumption, but of course, as a key aspect of labor markets, when what's on sale is commodified labor power that is meant to yield exchange values that themselves contains quotas of surplus value. Um, you know, that with the prospect of, you know, whether due to a pandemic induced depression uh, to another major economic crisis, like, you know, we were, you know, we're you know, it's only thanks to governments that normally would never be able to agree with each other, agreeing to conjure trillions of dollars out of thin air that the Great Recession wasn't a second Great Depression. Um, that, you know, it's it's only going to be thanks to, you know, severe crises or catastrophes um, that capitalism brings about that we have a hope of basically for sheer survival being forced to be practically utopian by reinventing, you know, these things in utter desperation. You know, and so that's, you know, to the extent that I'm hoping Hopeful that there will be a major transformation of how we think about earning a living, uh, what entitles one to a decent standard of living, etc. Um, one glimmer of hope for me is that I think that the crises that we're already in and further ones I think we can expect to face uh, will continue to, to push even the most reluctant uh, of, of those on, for, for instance, the political right, uh, to either have to take some of those measures or face, you know, an utter, you know, an utter implosion uh, of, you know, what they think that they're defending that will have to be reinvented in order to limp, on, limp along, if not survive. Okay, Jensen, you're up next. Uh, sure, yeah, I just, I actually, um, I don't really have that much to say about the Adorno issue. Um, one question that I did want to raise about Adorno though, and I guess this, this is another, it's a question for Henry, but, um, yeah, I was also just thinking after our last uh, exchange about the category of totality in Adorno and the model of the differential uh, sort of critique that you raised. And um, I guess I, I wanted to understand better what the political implications are of the differential model, because it's part of Adorno's emphasis on uh, utopia and totality um, you know, in the context of uh, the, the Marxist critique of political economy is that um, capitalist bourgeois society points beyond itself, that um, such a society as a whole is self-contradictory, must be overcome, and so forth. Um, how does the differential model that, that, that you've pointed to, um, is that a break from the the, the Marxian model of uh, the imminent critique of capital? Um, does it have the same commitment to socialism as uh, a political goal, as the realization of the promise of capital? So I guess, yeah, the, the two parts of the question are um, how, uh, how, how the category of totality, which is still very much at play, of course, for Adorno, relates to the differential model that you've talked about. Um, and also what, what role Adorno's commitment to socialist politics play um, in, uh, yeah, in the self-same model. 
of critique. Okay, so now we're about out of time, but um, there's one more question and um, it's by Rebecca, uh, but I, I thought that this question could serve as each of the panelists closing remarks. And the question is, how is Hegel being, or how has he been misused and abused by the left, perhaps even on this panel? We'll open with Andy. I don't know that, um, that Hegel's been misused on the left. It's uh, more that he's not used enough. The only thing I would say is I'm really fed up with the reliance on the phenomenology, uh, which, you know, thanks to marvelous uh, stuff by the French left, you know, and this came up in the late 40s, uh, that was fine, but uh, really the need to um, look at the, the logic and the encyclopedia generally. Um, there's, if we tell the general public or the broader left that Hegel's all about a master slave dialectic and you really got to leave, read the phenomenology, then we're going to guarantee a generation of leftists are going to be turned off Hegel for life. Um, the, the other thing is that we need to help people study Hegel, you know, get people reading, set up reading groups. Uh, it's not enough to publish a good book, actually help people read Hegel line by line so that they can appropriate their own understanding of Hegel. Okay, uh, now for Henry. Uh, Andy, you brought back a traumatic memory. I, I first started reading Hegel when I was an exchange student in Tübingen and there was a uh, philosopher was offering a course where they would read one chapter per semester. And they were on like the seventh year of reading uh, through the phenomenology. And there were, there were people by grandfather's age in the seminar who had stuck with it through the whole iteration. And it was an amazing um, uh, pedagogical experience. So I, 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 I want to second um, that kind of uh, project. Um, how has Hegel been misused? Um, I don't know about misused. I would say that one way of thinking about um, how Adorno might react to a Hegel is that he would ask the question, uh, when you're thinking as Hegel thinks, where does it hurt? Where is their suffering? Where is their harm? And that's an indication that the dialectic is maybe skipping over something, often a materialist moment that it should take into account. And I'll stop there and just say, thank you so much. This, the panel has been really fantastic. I really enjoyed this. All right, and now for Adrian. It's funny, uh, you know, Henry's traumatic memory then uh, uh, triggered one of my own, which was very similar. And when I was studying in Wuppertal, uh, joining a, uh, a reading group on Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, and it had been running at that point for six years. And uh, we were only at the very beginning of the B version of the transcendental deduction. And it was indeed line by line, sentence by sentence. And then, uh, you know, the, the you know, professor who was presiding over at Manfred Baum, uh, at the time, one of the editors of Kant Studien, uh, you know, would be able to take, you know, even, all right, why does Kant use of rather than from here, and then would tell a story that would start with the pre-Socratics and go all the way up to that moment in the first critique, and that's why that's the preposition being used. But anyhow, that trauma aside, um, I also would like to second Henry's comments and thank everyone for a thoroughly enjoyable experience. I wish we were able to spend more time doing this and moreover do it in person, but, you know, this has been a very in, uh, enjoyable uh, substitute for that. Um, apropos the question, you know, here, what I would limit myself to saying is that, you know, despite the fact that there's often a lot of sympathy in the leftist and especially Marxist tradition, towards Hegel, it's also the case that, you know, he has frequently, even within Marxism, and especially 20th century Western Marxism, um, that there are various caricatures that I think are, you know, real abuses of Hegel that are frequently relied upon, uh, whether implicitly or explicitly, um, you know, it involve, you know, whether indeed buying into the story of Hegel as, uh, you know, the uh, sellout conservative uh, uh, thinker who was a, an apologist pronouncing a philosophical benediction on Prussian reaction, 
you know, or in general, a totalitarian thinker in one way or another or in several ways, uh, you know, or, um, you know, this sort of uh, delusionally grandiose uh, metaphysician who was indeed an arch idealist as opposed to a materialist and had this idea of a godlike mega mind, uh, you know, devouring everything without remainder, or producing all of reality ex nihilo out of itself. Um, you have all of these different, you know, what a certain collection of essays critiquing these things uh, calls the Hegel myths and legends um, that indeed can also be found scattered throughout the history of leftist literature, including within Marxism. And, you know, those I think are the most egregious abuses or mistreatments of Hegel um, that don't involve reading him, but rather in a way accepting enemy propaganda of the sort that, you know, someone like Popper is responsible for um, and taking it as accurate. Um, so I'll you know, I think that suffices in terms of what I, I find most uh, concerning about abuses of Hegel in, in, in leftism. Okay, and lastly for Jensen. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to thank the other panelists. This has been fantastic and uh, you, Justin, for uh, moderating um, and everyone who's uh, watched. Um, yeah, I would agree with, uh, with Andy. Um, uh, and with Adrian, that uh, both that Hegel isn't used enough in a way, and that there's a persistent problem of the the character of Hegel. Um, but I also think that it's it's not so much a matter of contingent abuse uh, or misuse, but of the socially necessary form of appearance of Hegel's thought. One could say um, that uh, you know there are. Um, determinant reasons that Hegel has shown up in the way that he has shown up at different historical points. Um, I think that now, you know, it's uh, uh, a lot of the more promising work on Hegel is unfolding in the, you know, the unlikely sphere of um, analytic philosophy. Um, that itself, I think, speaks to a certain, um, uh, you know, the contemplativeness of the Hegel that, that we have today. Um, but at the same time, you know, as the dialectic usually works, um, that contemplativeness has yielded. Uh, it's been fruitful in, in, uh, in other ways, as in the work of someone like uh, Robert Pippin, who is self-avowedly an anti-Marxist thinker, um, you know, believes basically that, um, that capitalism is the, the final uh, economic form of human life, uh, these sorts of things. At the same time, um, you know, I think that there are resources in his work for, uh, you know, articulating a, a truly radical uh, understanding of what what Hegel is trying to do that counters all of the, you know, worst characters and caricatures and um, presuppositions about about Hegel that have dominated for really centuries. Um, so yeah, I would just emphasize that that we have to keep in mind that you know Hegel shows up as he does for a reason and you know, there's always some social historical constraint and why that's the case. And, you know, in the moment of the death of the left, it sort of makes sense that uh, Hegel would become an object of, you know, analytic contemplation. Um, so that's my thought on the matter. All right. I'd like to thank everybody, all of our panelists today for their remarks, which we really appreciated. This has been a panel by the Platypus Affiliated Society, and I just wanted to send out a reminder to uh, join our after panel discussion, which has been linked in the chat box, and also to find our virtual activities at platypus1917.org forward slash virtual. And we would like for this discussion to remain open. Uh, if you'd like to submit their thoughts about this to the Platypus Review, you can email editor at platypus1917.org. So thank you all, and have a good morning, evening, or night, depending on your time zone.